Theravada Buddhism defines arahant Pali, Sanskrit, ahit as one who has gained insight into the true nature of existence and has achieved nirvana. Other Buddhist traditions have used the term for people far advanced along the path of enlightenment, but who may not have reached full Buddhahood. The understanding of the concept has changed over the centuries, and varies between different schools of Buddhism and different regions. A range of views on the attainment of arhats existed in the early Buddhist schools. The Sarvastivada, Kasyapiya, Mahasamhika, Ekaviyavaharika, Lokottaravada, Bahasruthya, Prajnaptavada, and Katika schools all regarded arhats as imperfect in their attainments compared to Buddhas. Mahayana Buddhist teachings urge followers to take up the path of a bodhisattva, and to not fall back to the level of arhats and sravakas. The arhats, or at least the senior arhats, came to be widely regarded as moving beyond the state of personal freedom to join the bodhisattva enterprise in their own way. Mahayana Buddhism regarded a group of eighteen arhats with names and personalities as awaiting the return of the Buddha as Maitreya, and other groupings of six, eight, sixteen, one hundred, and five hundred also appear in tradition and Buddhist art, especially in East Asia. They can be seen as the Buddhist equivalents of the Christian saints, apostles or early disciples and leaders of the faith. Etymology Pali arahant is a present participle coming from the verbal root square root arh, to deserve, cf. aha, meriting, deserving, ahana having a claim, being entitled. Arita past participle, honored, worshipped. The word is used in the Raveda with this sense of deserving. A common folk etymology derives the word from Ari enemy and Hanta from the root square root Han cf. Hunter, to strike, to kill. Hence the translation, foe destroyer. Professor Richard Gombrich has argued that the present participle is jarring and seems out of place when there is an adjective from the same root aha". Since Jains used two Prakrit forms of the word arahanta and arihanta, the folk etymology may well be the correct etymology. Gombrich argues that this stems from the same metaphor as the Jain title Jina conqueror", whence Jaina related to the conqueror, i.e. Jainism. Meaning. In the early Buddhist schools In pre-Buddhist India, the term arhat, denoting a saintly person in general, was closely associated with miraculous power and asceticism. The Buddhists drew a sharp distinction between their arhat and Indian holy men in general. In Buddhism, these miraculous powers were no longer central to arhat identity or to his mission. A range of views on the relative perfection of arhats existed among the early Buddhist schools. In general, Mahasamphikas such as the Ekaviyavaharika, Lokottaravada, Bahasruthya, Prajnaptavada, and Katika schools, advocated the transcendental and supramundane nature of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the fallibility of arhats. The Katikas, for example, advocated the ideal of the Bodhisattva over that of the Arhat, and they viewed arhats as being fallible and still subject to ignorance, according to A.K. Warder, the Sarvastivadins held the same position as the Mahasamhika branch regarding arhats, considering them to be imperfect and fallible. In the Sarvastivadin Nagadatta Sutra, the demon Mara takes the form of Nagadatta's father, and tries to convince Nagadatta, who was a bhikshuni, to work toward the lower stage of arhatship rather than striving to become a fully enlightened Buddha Mara therefore took the disguise of Nagadatta's father and said thus to Nagadatta, Your thought is too serious. Buddhahood is too difficult to attain. It takes a hundred thousand niyutas of kotis of kalpas to become a Buddha. Since few people attain Buddhahood in this world, why don't you attain arhatship? For the experience of arhatship is the same as that of nirvana, moreover, it is easy to attain arhatship. In her reply, Nagadatta rejects arhatship as a lower path, saying, "...a Buddha's wisdom is like empty space of the ten quarters, which can enlighten innumerable people." 
but an Arhat's wisdom is inferior. The Kasyapiya school also held the doctrine that Arhats were fallible and imperfect, similar to the view of the Sarvastivadins and the various Mahasamhika sects. The Kasyapiyan believed that Arhats have not fully eliminated desires, that their perfection is incomplete, and that it is possible for them to relapse. In Theravada Buddhism In Theravada Buddhism, an arahant is a person who has eliminated all the unwholesome roots which underlie the fetters, who upon their death will not be reborn in any world, since the bonds fetters that bind a person to the samsara have been finally dissolved. In the Pali Canon, the word Tathagata is sometimes used as a synonym for Arahant, though the former usually refers to the Buddha alone. After attainment of Nibbana, the five aggregates physical forms, feelings, sensations, perception, mental formations, and consciousness will continue to function, sustained by physical bodily vitality. This attainment is termed the Nibbana element with a residue remaining. But once the arahant pass away and with the disintegration of the physical body, the five aggregates will cease to function, hence ending all traces of existence in the phenomenal world and thus total release from the misery of samsara. It would then be termed the nibbana element without residue remaining. Parinibbana occurs at the death of an arahant. In Theravada Buddhism, the Buddha himself is first identified as an arahant, as are his enlightened followers, because they are free from all defilements, existing without greed, hatred, delusion, ignorance and craving. Lacking assets, which will lead to future birth, the arahant knows and sees the real here and now. This virtue shows stainless purity, true worth, and the accomplishment of the end. Nibbana, in his study of the roles of arahants, Buddhas, and bodhisattvas, Nathan Katz writes that there is a tendency in the Theravada school to exclude laypeople from the possibility of achieving arahantship. While in the Sutta Pitaka, Arhata was open to all, both in principle and in fact, there was a growing tendency among later Theravada Sangakas to restrict Arhata to those wearing the robe. Earlier we indicated a Milindapana verse which held that while Arhata might be attainable by a layperson, within one day of its attainment he would have to either enter the Sangha or die. In the Pali Canon, Ananda states that he knows monastics to achieve Nibbana in one of four ways. One develops insight preceded by serenity Pali, Samatha Pubhangamam Vipassanam. One develops serenity preceded by insight Vipassana Pubhangamam Samatham. One develops serenity and insight in a stepwise fashion samatha vipassanam yuganadam. One's mind becomes seized by excitation about the Dhamma and, as a consequence, develops serenity and abandons the fetters Dhamma adhaka vigahitam manasam hoti, for those that have destroyed greed and hatred in the sensory context with some residue of delusion, are called anagami non Anagamis will not be reborn into the human world after death, but into the heaven of the pure abodes, where only Anagamis live. There, they will attain full enlightenment. The Theravadan commentator Buddhahosa placed the arahant at the completion of the path to liberation. In Mahayana Buddhism Mahayana Buddhists see Gautama Buddha himself as the ideal towards which one should aim in one's spiritual aspirations. A hierarchy of general attainments is envisioned with the attainments of Arhats and Pratyekabuddhas being clearly separate and below that of Samyaksambuddha or Tathagatas such as Gautama Buddha, in contrast to the goal of becoming a fully enlightened Buddha, the path of a sravaka in being motivated by seeking personal liberation from samsara is often portrayed as selfish and undesirable. There are even some Mahayana texts that regard the aspiration to arhatship and personal liberation as an outside path. Instead of aspiring for arhatship, Mahayanins are urged to instead take up the path of the bodhisattva and to not fall back to the level of arhats and sravakas. Therefore, it is taught that an arhat must go on to become a bodhisattva eventually. If they fail to do so in the lifetime in which they reach the attainment, they will fall into a deep samadhi of emptiness, thence to be roused and taught the bodhisattva path, presumably when ready. 
According to the Lotus Sutra, any true arhat will eventually accept the Mahayana path. Mahayana teachings often consider the Sravaka path to be motivated by fear of samsara, which renders them incapable of aspiring to Buddhahood, and that they therefore lack the courage and wisdom of a bodhisattva. Novice bodhisattvas are compared to Sravakas and arhats at times. In the Astasahishrika Prajnaparamita Sutra, there is an account of sixty novice bodhisattvas who attain arhatship despite themselves and their efforts at the bodhisattva path because they lacked the abilities of Prajnaparamita and skillful means to progress as bodhisattvas toward complete enlightenment This is because they are still viewed as having innate attachment and fear of samsara. The Astasahishrika Prajnaparamita Sutra compares these people to a giant bird without wings that cannot help but plummet to the earth from the top of Sumiru. Mahayan Buddhism has viewed the Sravaka path culminating in arhatship as a lesser accomplishment than complete enlightenment, but still accords due respect to arhats for their respective achievements. Therefore, Buddha realms are depicted as populated by both Sravakas and Bodhisattvas. Far from being completely disregarded, the accomplishments of arhats are viewed as impressive, essentially because they have transcended the mundane world. Chinese Buddhism and other East Asian traditions have historically accepted this perspective, and specific groups of arhats are venerated as well, such as the 16 arhats, the 18 arhats, and the 500 arhats. The first famous portraits of these arhats were painted by the Chinese monk Guangxiu in 891 CE. He donated these portraits to Shengyan Temple in Qiantang, modern Hangzhou, where they are preserved with great care and ceremonious respect. In some respects, the path to arhatship and the path to complete enlightenment are seen as having common grounds. However, a distinctive difference is seen in the Mahayana doctrine pushing emotional and cognitive non-attachment to their logical consequences. Of this, Paul Williams writes that in Mahayana Buddhism, nirvana must be sought without being sought for oneself, and practice must be done without being practiced. The discursive mode of thinking cannot serve the basic purpose of attainment without attainment. Topic. Attainments A range of views on the attainment of arhats existed in the early Buddhist schools. The Sarvastivada, Kasyapiya, Mahasamhika, Ekaviyavaharika, Lokottaravada, Bahasruthiya, Prajnaptavada and Katika schools all regarded arhats as being imperfect in their attainments compared to Buddhas. The Dharmaguptaka sect believed that the Buddha and those of the two vehicles, although they have one and the same liberation, have followed different noble paths." The Mahisasaka and the Theravada regarded arhats and Buddhas as being similar to one another. The 5th century Theravadan commentator Buddhahosa regarded arhats as having completed the path to enlightenment. According to Bhikkhu Bodhi, the Pali Canon portrays the Buddha declaring himself to be an arahant. According to Bhikkhu Bodhi, Nirvana is the ultimate goal, and one who has attained Nirvana has attained Arahantship. Bhikkhu Bodhi writes, The defining mark of an Arahant is the attainment of Nirvana in this present life. The Mahayana discerned a hierarchy of attainments, with Samyaksambuddhas at the top, Mahasattvas below that, Pratyekabuddhas below that, and Arhats further below. But what was it that distinguished the Bodhisattva from the Sravaka, and ultimately the Buddha from the Arhat? The difference lay, more than anywhere else, in the altruistic orientation of the Bodhisattva. <laughs> Translations The term Arhat is often rendered in English as Arahat. The term arhat was transliterated into some East Asian languages phonetically, for example, the Chinese aluohan ch. A luohan often shortened to simply luohan ch. Luohan this may appear in English as luohan or lohan. In Japanese the pronunciation of the same Chinese characters is rakan ya. Luohan or arakan ya. A luohan. The Tibetan term for arhat was translated by meaning from Sanskrit. This translation, Dgrab Kompa, means, one who has destroyed the foes of afflictions. 
Thus the Tibetan translators also understood the meaning of Arhat to be Arihanta. See also Arihant Jainism Buddhist paths to liberation Four stages of enlightenment Pratyekabuddha Yijan glazed pottery Luahans equals equals notes <laughs>